practice prepper. Hey YouTube, this is Praxis Prepper, and in this video we're talking about the day 5.5 episode of Praxis Prepper Alien Invasion. We're going to talk about some of the discussion topics that were brought up in that episode, and while normally at the end of this type of video I would share with you a sneak peek of what's happening next week on the show, I'm releasing next week's episode, or uh, the, you know, the next episode today, so there's no point in doing that. Uh, but if you want to find out what's going to happen on the day seven episode, which is after the day six episode, uh, you can check out the discussion topic video on the for the day six episode, and I will be sharing a sneak peek of the day seven episode on there. But before any of that, if you haven't seen the day 5.5 episode, there's a link up above or inside or wherever the links pop up. You can click on that and watch the, that video before I do any spoilers in this video. Wait a moment. Okay, and now we'll begin. So what's going on in this video is it's immediately following uh, my character seeing his neighbor get shot by one of the alien probes. And there's a really strong desire on the part of my character to try to start coming to some, com coming to some conclusions about you know, what that means about you know, why the aliens are here, you know, what, what is the threat level, you know, are they hostile, all that kind of stuff. And my character doesn't really have all that much information. At the moment, all he really knows is that there were ships in the sky, the power went out, and he's seen one of them shoot somebody. Now, in the episode, uh, the person that gets shot is in the process of sort of swinging up a rifle towards the, uh, the, this little floating drone ship. And my character's feeling is that he wants to conclude from that that maybe the ship wouldn't be hostile, but it was defending itself, or maybe it had just come down to, to shoot the person. He's having trouble coming to some conclusions, but obviously he wants to come to some conclusions. People don't like to live in an information vacuum. They like to believe that they know what's going on around them. And uh, the problem with humans is that we don't tend to be very good at that. I think science is a really great way of coming to conclusions. You get lots of data points, and then you start making some guesses about that, and then you keep testing those guesses and always being open to the idea that maybe your guesses were wrong and always being open to more information. That works fairly well, but humans are not by nature scientific thinkings. We uh, are not by nature scientific thinkers. Uh, I think by nature we are magical, kind of mythological thinkers. And 99.9% .9 of our, our history, from what we know of it, is that we came to conclusions about things through sort of knee-jerk sort of magical thinking about them. Like, oh, there's, there's thunder and lightning in the background. Must be Thor fighting with giants. You know, what, else, what the hell else could, could it be? Um, that, that defines, I think, most of our existence. And it is a real, it's a real challenge, I think, for people to withhold judgment on things until they get more information. Or to make a tentative conclusion, but always being open to, uh, to changing that conclusion if more information comes in. Uh, you know, any scientific study that's ever been done on people demonstrates that when people come to an initial conclusion on things, it's very difficult for them to change their mind on it later. And it's also very difficult for people to avoid coming to a conclusion in the first place. And I think whenever there is uh, a situation where someone has to make a decision about something or has to start trying to map out their world uh, where they don't really know what's going on, there's an enormous allure to people to try to feel like they, they know something that they don't necessarily know. And that isn't just with big things like explaining, you know, what's the nature of lightning or does, you know, the sun go around the earth or, you know, are the aliens go here to kill us or, or anything like that. I, it goes for all sorts of little things. And I think you see it uh, in our political spectrum today. People uh, pick up on a few little data points and especially on the internet, uh, they are either intentionally or so unconsciously kind of pre-selecting what data points they're listening to. So people come to a lot of erroneous conclusions about things. Uh, like, like right now, it's like, it's snowing, ergo, you know, there mustn't be any global warming. I think, I think that is a really good uh, example of people taking little data points and using them to come to some sort of conclusion that might feel good, but it doesn't necessarily represent the broader scope of the information that's out there. There's lots of other things like that. By the way, goodbye to the 10 people I just lost on my channel. That make sure you let me know that you're unsubscribing because my channel's offensively liberal, you know, on the way out the door. I'm so sorry to lose you. <laughs> uh, but for the rest of you, they're still hanging around. And again, you know, uh, even for climate change, my mind is open to the idea that, you know, maybe people don't have the whole view on that. And there are other things like solar inputs uh, on, uh, on this whole system here. So, you know, even though it seems like fairly sound science that uh, CO2 levels and methane levels rising in our atmosphere are going to lead towards a warming of our atmosphere. 
the sun looks like it might be going into a cooling cycle. So who the hell knows about all this stuff? The point is, is that even when you have a lot of information, it's always important to have your mind open to more information. Have you ever found yourself uh, jumping to a conclusion that you found out later was wrong? Have you, or I, I think I'll get a, even more responses if I ask, have you ever seen other people doing that kind of thing? I, and while it, it, might, it, it feels better to see it in other people, it's more useful if whenever we can find it in ourselves and always be a little bit more self-critical about the beliefs that we have and whether or not those beliefs are, are based on sound uh, evidence or maybe we came to them you know, rather quickly and maybe we should be more open to other information. What do you think about that? Is it really critical, especially in a disaster situation, to always be flexible in your thinking and don't let your uh, mind plasticize? Stay, keep your mind liquid so that as new information comes in, you're not going to miss out and make, uh, come to bad conclusions uh, you know, based on, on the scant information that you have available to you. So that, that's topic one in the video. And topic two, it's uh, not quite as important, I think, maybe it's important, uh, is the idea of having a, you know, a, a nice paper reading library if there's ever uh, some kind of a collapse event or something like that. Uh, or even just a power outage, you know, you can't watch a movie or play a video game or, or, <laughs> or you know, play with your smartphone. Uh, I've always uh, tried to keep a really nice paper library in my house, and I, I've been meaning to do a whole video just on the idea of having a good paper library, but is that something that's in your mind? And I don't mean just a paper library that has, you know, reference books about, like, you know, how to, I don't know, suck snake venom out of a wound or, <laughs> or whatever, but having a, a nice library just for relaxation and entertainment and, uh, you know, being able to decompress at the end of a hard day. Uh, the majority of my library is stuff that isn't really survival related. It's, you know, you know, classic books, you know, you know, new, you know, fiction, uh, you know, I have a sci-fi section, I have a fantasy section, I have all, all different types of things. I go to the thrift bookstore and I get books for like 10 cents or a quarter and it's, you know, every time I go to the thrift store I usually come back with a big bag full of books because I'm just... I love the idea of having access to all those things. Is that something that you have? Uh, what do you think are critical things uh, that should be in a library in terms of survival information? I know I, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a big hunter. Uh, you know, I get most of my my kills from roadkill <laughs> whenever I do get them. But I do have some hunting books uh, that uh, you know, if the shit ever hit the fan, and I wanted to maybe familiarize myself with that a little bit more. You know, I would have that accessible to me. Granted, I would have been a hell of a lot better off if I'd been practicing those skills ahead of time, but at the moment I'm just not in a position where I want to go out killing animals where I don't have to. So that's a decision that I've made. Maybe it'll be a liability for me. But what are some things that you think are really important to have in a reference library or just an entertainment library for a collapse uh, sort of scenario? I've, I know I did a book a review recently on The Grapes of Wrath uh, that I, you know, I thought it was a great collapse book. But I think during collapse, you're not going to necessarily want to be reading about collapse. You might want to read about something that's not terrible or horrible or mirroring in any way the, the, the troubles that you're going through uh, during your your daily routine during that collapse event. So that's it on this video. Normally I would go to a sneak, clip, uh, sneak peek of next week, but you can just skip right ahead to the day six episode because it's live on YouTube right now for you to check out. That's it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.